Well, we're here. This is Christmas Sunday, and it's a very special time of year for Christians. Um, if you're here visiting with us, there's a, a lot of places you could be, and we thank you for being here with us this morning. And we hope that you um, get something out of what you're, what you're going to hear, hopefully what you've already heard and participated in. Uh, would you just open with me in a word of prayer this morning as we come before God and his word? Lord Jesus, this morning is all about you. The songs that we sing, the joy that we have, the hope that is ours, all of it is because of you. The story never gets old. We never get tired of it. And it will never be irrelevant. Lord, I pray this morning as we just look at the simple basics of that Christmas story, that true event that happened over 2,000 years ago, that you would help us to see something that we haven't seen before, that your spirit would take your word and just turn a light on somewhere inside each person here. Many of us know the story by heart. Show us something we haven't seen. To many of us, this story may be new. Help us to understand it. Mostly, Lord, help us to see you. Help us to see you in a new light. This morning, I just ask that your spirit, who is present with us and among us, would bring comfort to those who are hurting, healing to those that are in pain, enlightenment to those who are confused, Peace to those who are troubled, and joy to those who are sad. Lord, we just simply ask that you would make sure that nobody leaves here the same way we came in. Change us because we have come into your presence. And all God's people said, <clears throat> Amen. Well, it's, it's Christmas time again. All the decorations are out in full display. Hopefully, you've had a chance to see them and enjoy them. And once again, we. We have the confusion that shows up every, every year. Uh, who owns Christmas? What's it about? Uh, do the Christians own Christmas? Uh, do the ancient Romans own Christmas? Does Madison Avenue own Christmas? Do all the shops who sell stuff own Christmas? What's the whole crazy thing about? Why does it matter? And uh, maybe most important, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? This morning, we're going to share one really short verse in the whole Christmas story. And in fact, one of the most important because it's the one verse that gives us a different perspective on Christmas. It gives us God's perspective on Christmas. What was happening on his end? What he was doing on this Christmas morning that we celebrate? But I need to give you a warning. It's, um, it's not all that flattering, just to give you a heads up, um, God coming to earth in the form of a little baby to show, it, it did not come to the earth in the form of a little baby to show how endearing he can be when he tries. Christmas is actually a four alarm, lights flashing, sirens screaming, human emergency that God came to rescue us from that we were totally and completely oblivious to. That's what Christmas is. The verse is found in Luke chapter 211. The angels have come. There are some shepherds watching their flocks. The flocks they were watching were probably the sacrificial lambs that were offered in the temple. And they're out watching the, the angels appear. There's a great light. And the angel begins speaking to the shepherds. The shepherds are scared to death. So the angels make sure they say, Hey, I got some good news. And then he says, Today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And that's all we're going to look at this morning, just that. A Savior was coming, which means there was danger. But of course, the problem was at the moment, humanity didn't sense any danger. None of the shepherds sensed any great danger other than the, the angels. Humanity was finally at peace, Rome saw to that. So we were... We really didn't sense that there was any danger, anything to be saved from. And it's hard to get people excited about being saved when they don't sense that there's any danger. 
It's kind of like an island people. They have this wonderful, comfortable little life. Everything's perfect. Sun is always shining. It's beautiful. They're just having another day. They have no idea a tsunami is heading their way and it's going to completely destroy them. They have no idea. They're oblivious to it. Everything seems fine at the moment. So a warning was given on this Christmas morning, but it was given when everything was at peace, when everything was calm. You know, you can be going on in life and think that all is just fine, when in reality, things aren't fine at all. When a person is unable to break a pattern uh, of self-destructive behavior, and they have loved ones that care for them, the loved ones will often do, loved ones or friends will often do what we call an intervention. And I mentioned, we see somebody whose life is spiraling out of control or going in a dangerous direction, or they're going to hurt themselves or others. And so if you, if you love this person, what you do is you get in between them and the danger, and you say, stop. Look at what you're doing. We're here to tell you, you need to pay attention to this. There's something very dangerous going on. Maybe they're addicted to a substance, or they're out of control, or they're courting death by their lifestyle. Maybe they're alienating family and friends, whatever. And, and so you intervene. The problem is the intervention is not usually appreciated. Nine times out of ten, it's, I don't need help. I've got this completely under control. If you did, there wouldn't be a room full of people worried about you. If you love this person, though, you risk the anger. If you love the person you risk the alienation. If you really care about what happens to them, you risk having them say, I never want to see you again. You risk all of that because it's worth it because you love them. That's the key. If you don't, didn't love them, there wouldn't be an intervention. And that brings us to Christmas. Christmas was God coming to do a divine intervention. That's what it's all about. It's what the whole story is about. Who's he intervening for? You. You. Me. What we celebrate every year on December 25th is God's divine intervention. What is so endearing about the whole thing is the way that he arrived. Because he arrived so gently, so humbly that we realize this is probably not bad news just by the way he arrived. We were able to discern by the way he arrived that his intentions were good, not bad. So now we're going to look at this little sentence, this one sentence in Luke. And we're going to see that there are four pivotal words in this one little sentence that spell God's intervention, that explain and illustrate God's intervention for us. And the first word we're going to see is the word Born. Born. There has been born for you. The first thing we're told is that whoever this amazing person is who's coming, they're going to be human. Why is this important? Who was sharing this message? Angels. So what do the angels say to the shepherds? The one's coming is one of you. It's not going to be one of us. It's going to be human. So when you go looking for him, don't go looking for an angel. Go looking for a baby. The person will have grown in the womb of a human mother. In the Greek language, the word born stands very close to the beginning of the sentence. So literally it should read, because born to you this day is a savior. In other words, this birth is a special birth, unlike any other. His humanity is very real, but it's also very special. Lots of babies were being born. The angels weren't proclaiming all those other babies, just this one. In the Greek, by the way, the you is plural. There has been born for you. For you. Who is he born for? You. For me. For us. Whoever this amazing person being born was, he was being born for all of us. And notice that Luke does not say Jesus was born to be a savior, he already was one. This is important. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God from all eternity, 
was our Savior before he came to die for us, before he came to live for us. He didn't come to fulfill a role. He came to earth and took a human form to fulfill his person. In other words, he wasn't playing the part of of our Savior. He was our Savior. Before he ever jumped from heaven to earth, he was our Savior, the one who saves. He wasn't playing the part He had been born as a human baby to save us. You know, before the Civil War, a lowly alcoholic former soldier named Ulysses S. Grant was in such bad financial straits that he was selling firewood on street corners, trying to make ends meet, feed his family. In his old tattered uniform and jeans, beard unkempt, just a real mess. The next year, Things were even worse. He had to sell his gold watch just to be able to have any Christmas for his kids. Things were bad. He couldn't find a good job. Couldn't hold it down because of his disease. And then, Union went to war. All of a sudden, we have a civil war. The only thing that this guy had ever really been good at was being a soldier. So he entered the Union Army and kept rising up the ranks because he was good at what he did. Finally, he became the top general for Abraham Lincoln, the most successful general he had, responsible for causing the surrender of Robert E. Lee and winning the Civil War for Lincoln. Grant filled the role the Union Army and the Union itself needed of a military savior, but he wasn't born one. Had we not had the Civil War, I doubt any of us would have ever heard of Ulysses S. Grant. Jesus, on the other hand, was born for one purpose, to be your savior. That's why he was born. That's why he came. It was a role assigned to him by his father. He was our savior from the beginning, and when the time came, he arrived to do that for which he alone was qualified, and by the way, he alone was motivated. He was born. He's one of us. He was human. He's not like one of these guys that has spider webs shooting out of his hands or a, or a big, you know, shield to protect him from the bad guys or the the hammer of Thor. He didn't have all of those things. He's a little baby. Excuse me, he pooped and he peed and he cried and he fussed and needed to be kept warm and needed to be comforted. He was one of us. He was born. Why did he come? Well, the answer to that's back in the very beginning of the Bible. Back in the Garden of Eden. In the beginning, Adam was the only human. He was the representative before God of man, and and he blew it. And when he sinned, he set the pattern for the rest of us, and the rest of us did exactly what he did. He sinned against God. We sinned against God. Bad pattern, bad pattern continued. So God came to our world to hit reset. That's what Jesus was coming to do to reset so that there's a new representative because Adam was such a failure. So God says, I'm going to send somebody who will actually do what I always wanted you to do, to be what I always wanted you to be. Jesus became the obedient representative who would please God in every way. He was a perfect answer to sinful man. But he also became a man for one other very important reason. It's really hard to understand love when it's way out there and you can't see it, isn't it? I mean, somebody in Idaho can send me a letter saying, Dan, I really love you. Well, that's nice. Never met you, don't know who you are from Adam. Doesn't really mean a lot, does it? It means much more when one of you tell me because I know you. How do you know the love of God? Well, we know it in Christ. We could see the love of God so much more clearly in Jesus because he became one of us. So we could see it eke out through humanity. Hear it in words that we understood. See it in facial expressions we could get. See it in eyes that we could understand. His kindness, his wisdom, his patience, his self-sacrificial love would never have been clear to us, as clear to us, unless he became a man. So Jesus wasn't God loving us more It was God loving us in a way we could truly understand. That was huge, just huge. He was born for us, for our sakes. Have you ever seen a 
And you've probably done this yourself. You see a little toddler, a little child. I've got a little grandson now, about, about yay big. And very rarely do I go, hello, room. What do we do? Hi, Rune. How you doing, buddy? What? We get down on their level. Why? Because up here's scary. Up here, I'm superior to you. I'm stronger than you. I'm bigger than you. But then you get down on their level, and you, you're looking at them right in their eyes, and they're not afraid of you. Christmas is when God did that. So we wouldn't be afraid of him. Because he'd actually come to bring us what kind of news? Good news. I don't think through all eternity we will ever truly understand what really happened when the God who created everything, the God who fills everything, the God who created galaxies we will never see, humbled himself to become a human baby. And that's why that word born is so incredibly important. He became human. The word born spells God's divine intervention. Let's take a look at that second word. It spells divine intervention. There has been born for you a Savior. A Savior. See, the very word tells you there's danger somewhere. You, nobody needs to be saved from nothing. Hey, I'm here to save you. From what? Well, nothing, really. Well, okay, then really you're not a Savior, okay? You're just kind of blowing air around. There's got to be a danger for there to be a Savior. Whoever this special person was who was coming, his mission was to be a Savior. Now, this is really important because, remember, they're talking about a very important, powerful person that's going to be born. You know, if you look back historically, most of the really powerful people who were born were kind of scary. Look what they ended up doing. I mean, the Hitlers, the Stalins, the, the Attila the Hun, Napoleon, they, they were very powerful. And they, powerful men can do powerful damage. And they usually do, as a matter of fact. So what we needed to, to know in order to really anticipate eagerly this person was that he came to save us from some danger. That was his mission. He saw the danger we didn't see, so he was coming and he was going to rescue us from that. Very frequently in life, we're completely unaware of any danger that we're in. There's a real danger. We have no idea it's there. Some of you know, some of you don't, but not that long ago I was in an emergency room and had a case of acute pancreatitis. But while they were there, they gave me blood tests. And the blood test said, hey, by the way, just side note here, did you know your, your kidneys suck? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're, they're not very good at all. They're working on about 50% capacity right now, and they're heading downhill. You got chronic kidney disease, stage three. Did you know that? No. I had no idea. Now, here's the thing. Your kidneys can get really bad for a long time, and, and you won't know about it. That crazy emergency room thing, that was really good. Because now I know what's going on with my kidneys. And I can do something about it and stabilize them, which I have. What if I hadn't heard about it? They say that often, if you don't know what's happening, by the time you find out you've got 5 to 10% of your kidney left, and then it's too late. So what was going on? It was a blessing that I ended up in the ER or might not have discovered the problem until it was too late. While humanity didn't know it, like I didn't know that I had a kidney problem, God saw our danger. And so Jesus' coming was, was kind of like the x-ray, the blood test that says, this is a problem. This is a danger. It's why the words to an old hymn written by a man who knew and loved God said this, Be my example and my guide, my friend, the everything beside. But first, last, best, whatever be tied, be thou to me. My Savior. Of all the things we really need from God, what we mostly need is for him to save us. And by the way, not just once. I don't know about you, but pretty much weekly, I need God to save me from something somebody else has done or most of the time something I've done. We continually need a Savior. And this was a message of peace to a world that had known so much war. We were being sent a Savior. 
But sadly, even the absence of war doesn't bring peace. It was the ancient Stoic philosopher Epictetus who said of his emperor, While the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns more than even for outward peace. See, there's an external peace, that's nice, but you know, a lot of people in countries that aren't at war, aren't going to be at war, can't stand living. They have no peace, no joy. There's something else we need. This is powerful. You know, in the first part of chapter 2 of Luke here, Luke mentions a man that everybody was familiar with. His name was Caesar Augustus. Now, why, why did Luke mention Caesar Augustus? Well, there's several reasons, but one very important one was to help connect the dots, to help them understand the kind of person who had been born to them. The people under Roman's rule at that time knew who Caesar was, Caesar Augustus, their savior. That was his title. They called him their savior and their lord. So when you hear the word savior, to them, that's not a Christian word. That word existed before the church showed up. Caesar was the one who saves us. Caesar is the one who's our lord. He eventually became the the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Augustus Caesar, by the way, was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. Became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire after a bloody civil war in which he beat up everybody else who wanted to be a ruler. He went on to make the Roman Republic into an empire with him at the head. And he proclaimed that he had brought justice and peace to the world. He also declared his dead adoptive father to be God, thus making himself the son of God quite conveniently. So, do you see what Luke is doing? There is this person in our world right now, Caesar Augustus. He's the big honcho. Everything's about him. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. And then he he takes us somewhere else. You know, poets wrote songs about the new era that had begun. Historians told the story of Rome's long rise to greatness, reaching its climax with Augustus. And Romans believed Augustus was the savior of the world, its king and its lord. And with all his military success, who could blame them? I mean, all we've got are eyes to see, and it was pretty impressive. In the eastern part of the empire, he was worshipped as God. And yet, here's what Luke is saying. In the distant eastern frontier of the mighty Roman Empire, under the rule of the acknowledged savior of the world, Caesar Augustus, a little baby is born, who would soon be called the Son of God, Savior, and Lord. He would be said to be the one who would truly bring truth, justice, and peace to the world. So Luke knew what he was doing when he was talking about Caesar and echoing Jesus. The world's version of the human Savior of man, the human Son of God, and compared him with God's human Savior, the true anointed one, the true Lord of all time. Now, at the time that Luke wrote this, who was Lord and Caesar? Who was Lord and Savior? It was Caesar. He was the guy. Everybody acknowledged it. And here's this little guy writing this letter about about what happened with this guy named Jesus, little baby. No, he's going to be the Savior of the the world. He's going to be the Lord. Who would have bought that? Nobody bought that. But time has proved Luke right. Who now worships Caesar Augustus? Who now claims Caesar Augustus is their savior? Who now claims Caesar Augustus is king and lord of the world? No one. But at this moment today, two billion plus people would die for the name of Jesus Christ, who they claim to be their lord and savior. And billions before them. Who was right? Luke was right. He knew what he was doing. You know, as people, we have a built-in belief that we should be able to save ourselves. You know, nobody wants to be rescued. We want to be the rescuers, right? It's embarrassing to have to be rescued. And so we kind of resist that. I don't need help. I'm fine. I can take care of myself. It leaves us feeling helpless. We don't like that feeling. But God sending us a Savior means we were truly helpless and hopeless in his eyes. Nothing we could do would save us. Remember we talked about Adam and Eve, we had sinned, we had broken God's law. The penalty for that was hell. 
eternal separation from God. Remember, we just spent nine weeks talking about hell, didn't we? This is what he came to save us from, was this thing, this hell. Luke knew what he was doing here. A British pastor named Glenn Scrivener, he asked us to imagine that you've entered a race, maybe the Boston Marathon. Now, some of us, that's quite an imaginative thing, right? <laughs> I, I wouldn't even ride a bike in that thing. It's too far. But some people could, right? So imagine that somebody entered the race under my name and won. They won. So all of a sudden, I am hailed as an amazing athlete. I get winded brushing my teeth. But I'm hailed as this great athlete, and I'm given this large sum of money. Why, because I'm a great athlete? No, because somebody raced for me. Somebody raced that race for me and won it for me. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on. God sending Jesus to be our Savior was God sending his Son to be and do all he had expected us to do, but we couldn't. And when we place our faith in him, we could get that obedience credited to us. That's grace. That's mercy. That's God saying, you can't be good enough. You never could, but that's okay. I sent my son to be good enough for you. Annette and I kind of have a, a running joke. She'll be uh, in the kitchen making dinner. I'll be at the counter watching her. <laughs> and so she'll at some point say, uh, honey, could, could you give me some, some milk out of the refrigerator? Or, uh, honey, could you, could you go get this uh, utensil out of the drawer? And I'll go over and I'll get it. And then I'll say, but I got to tell you, honey, because I've done this, I get a full assist on dinner. You have to tell everybody, I helped you make dinner. <laughs> when in reality, I did just a little bit less than nothing for that whole meal. That's our position before God. We want to be able to say, I did this, and we didn't. Salvation is from beginning to end the work of a gracious, merciful God. A Savior. That's who was sent to us. A Savior. It means we were going down for the third time. No hope was available, and yet he'd come to rescue us completely from our sins and the punishment they deserved. So the second word that spells divine intervention is Savior. The third word that spells divine intervention is Christ. Christ. Christ means Messiah, anointed one. The one the Old Testament had promised was going to come one day and rescue Israel and the whole world. And this person was supposed to connect the dots between everything we'd heard in the Old Testament that was supposed to one day come true and did in the New Testament. This person was to connect those dots, the Christ, the Messiah who was to come. He wouldn't be some freelancer doing his own thing. The Messiah would never be somebody who said, you know, I'm just looking around at the world. It's kind of messed up. I think I'm going to do something about it. He's not a freelancer. He's not a guy that says, I, I, I'm going to do this on my own. This was somebody who was sent specifically for this. You know, Muhammad considered himself a prophet. But there was no prophecy announcing his coming. God did not send messengers for hundreds of years about his coming. He did that with Jesus. Over and over in the Old Testament, there's an accounting of someone who's going to come. God marked Jesus out as incredibly special before he ever arrived on the scene. The word Christ is a Greek word for anointed one, just as Messiah is our transliteration of the Hebrew word meaning the same thing, anointed one. So Christ was the one who's going to come and fix everything. What was he going to fix? What well, we broke. We broke the world, and we broke us. And that's why we have trouble with our world, and we have trouble with each other, amen? We do. It was broke. And he'd come to fix it. We're drawn to those people who promise they're going to fix everything, who guarantee they can do what we need. The presidential candidate who says, you know, I'm going to be the next Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to be the next George Washington. And you know, we want it to be true. We want him or her, whoever, they, we want that to be true. We'd love that to be true. And they feel that they're destined to do this, and we want to believe that. We want to believe someone will come and fix what's broken. 
uh, in our kitchen. Annette and I have an electric induction oven, which means it's all electric. And uh, sometimes, frequently, it fails. It just starts going beep, beep, beep. Won't do anything else. That's all it does. So I got to go all the way outside, flip the breaker, wait five minutes, cold. Flip the breaker again, go back in, and everything's fine. Well, you can understand that every once in a while it gets old. So we called somebody in to, uh, to look at it. We kind of called around, you know, trying to find somebody who's supposed to be good at this. And we got some names. They said, yeah, these guys should be able to, to fix your appliance. So we called them in. And this fellow shows up. He's maybe early 30s. And I, I bring him into the kitchen. I says, here's our stove. And I explained to him what it does. And he's looking at it. And then he got real quiet. And he said, to be honest with you, I've never actually worked on one of these, <laughs> but uh, I, I can call somebody who has. Now, you can't imagine the confidence I was filled with <laughs> at that moment. And uh, so I said, well, okay, the person he called that knew about this was the manufacturer. And so he's on the phone for 15 or 20 minutes. And he keeps asking the guy's questions. So I'm understanding this guy hasn't got a clue what's wrong with her, how to fix it. But he comes back in a little while later and says, okay, I know what's wrong with it. We've got to replace this thing. It's going to cost a bazillion dollars. <laughs> and I, uh, I said, and I quote, I'll get back with you. <laughs> Our cooktop still doesn't work properly, but it didn't cost us a dime. You see, we want to believe that our problems are fixable. But here's the thing. If you don't really know why it's not working, you can't fix it. If you don't know where it's really broken, you can't fix it. Since the dawn of time, humanity has been trying to fix us. One human Messiah after another, we'll fix it, I'll fix it, this, this, this is a problem, this is a problem. And they were all like my repairman. They meant well. They just didn't understand the nature of the problem. And so they might make you feel good for a few minutes, a few months, a few years, but they didn't really fix anything. So God had promised, though, that one day he would send somebody who would. In the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with what? Salvation. That means he's going to save you from something. Humble. The Savior is going to be humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey, hundreds of years before Jesus ever shows up. This prophecy comes. Isaiah the prophet, chapter 53, verse 7, talks about what this guy was going to go through. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Speaking of Jesus, Psalm 22 is called a messianic psalm, meaning that it refers to the coming Messiah and what would happen to him. Chapter 22, verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. All of these things and dozens more that I haven't brought up were fulfilled in only one person. Jesus Christ. All these things were told would take place. Who would, who would this person be? Christ. The anointed one, the coming one, the promised one. The divine repairman who could actually fix what we had broken. The third word that spells divine intervention is Christ. But the last word that spells divine intervention is Lord. Lord. And here we learn that though this person would be human, he would be more than just human. He would one day demand and deserve allegiance from every single creature that has ever come into being. And he wasn't a Lord. He was the Lord. Why is this important? Man, we have had millions of Lords 
A lord is simply somebody who's in charge of a group of people in a certain place or at a specific time. And they had power. They had authority for a while. And then they died, and then all goes away. And somebody else comes in and takes their place. Here's the problem. No one can hold on to their power and authority after death. That's kind of when you lose it. Right? That's the problem. So the only way you could hold on to power forever is if you could defeat death itself. Hmm. Hmm. So this special person will have authority over all the people of authority who have ever lived. He is the Lord of Lords, the final one. And by the way, isn't that interesting? This is precisely what was prophesied by Isaiah hundreds of years earlier in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, listen, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. The government. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now listen to a little bit more about his government. There will be no end to the increase of his government. I don't know if you follow politics, but I do. I don't know why I do, but I do. <laughs> and you know what you find out? People's parties go up and down. You like a certain party? Good, because you know what's going to happen? They're going to go up and down. Up and down. Up and down. Up and down. Power party comes in. Power party leaves. New power party comes in. New power party leaves. That's how human governments work. But here's going to come a guy, and there will be no end to his government. When he sets it up, it's the last one. Or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. No new parties. No new need. Just one king. You know, human history has been a really sad and vain attempt at, to find a truly perfect leader that we can trust, love, and want to serve and obey. We really do long to find that person that we respect. I want you to be my leader. I, I want to follow your guidance. I really do. We want that person who can make the, the hard decisions with perfect wisdom, rule with perfect integrity, understand the, the complex issues we face with an unrivaled intelligence, and yet be gracious and kind and merciful. And the promise here is that that's who this person will be. It's what this person will be. Lord. The Lord, Yahweh. Here's, here's the problem with human leaders. They can rule over you. That's all they can do. They can rule over you. In China right now, there's a premier, and he rules over two billion plus people. A lot of folks. He rules over them. But Jesus not only rules over he rules in. He's the only one that you can say, I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I follow him willingly. I will follow him willing to, to death. I want to. Now, the Chinese will follow the premier, not because they love him, but because they're scared of him. He rules over them, but he cannot rule in them, which proves that Jesus' rule is unlike any other human leader. Jesus can be Lord not only in our world, but in our hearts. And no one can take Jesus' place in our hearts. He's to us the pearl of great price. That thing that you find that is finally worth more than everything else you've got and anything else you'd want. It's so valuable. That's why he said it's a pearl of great price. That's who Jesus is to us. So the one who was born, the one who is our Savior, the one anointed to rescue us is the Lord himself, Yahweh, God in the flesh. You know, we have a saying in our world, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Do it yourself. That's what God did. See, there's, there's no margin for error in the divine rescue operation, so God came himself. No human messenger could get this job done. You know, when I was a little boy in Sunday school, I always got the impression that God was distant and aloof, that uh, it seemed to me that God was just kind of sitting up in heaven, just waiting to judge us for our mistakes, cold, distant, dangerous, fair, but scary. 
No one had ever explained to me that actually that story that they kept telling us about that little baby was that they, they were the same ones. I never made that connection. You're telling me that that big God, that, that the big one, the big guy, became the baby? Nobody ever really explained that to me. But when they did, it changed everything. He was intimately involved in my life, tenderly calling me to himself, offering me grace and pardon and new life. You know, moments before the conception of Jesus of Nazareth in the womb of Mary, moments before, he had been in heaven on his throne at the right hand of the Father, receiving praise and honor and glory as angels bowed before him and sang his praises. From that place, he looked out on the entire universe that he had made, that he ruled. And the next moment, he was a microscopic clump of cells in a tiny place within a young peasant woman in the backwater area of the great Roman Empire. He stripped himself of all of his dignity, all of his honor, all of his glory. Why? To rescue you. You. To rescue you. Jesus was born to rescue, save, redeem, restore us to our relationship to God, to remove us from the great danger of hell we were heading towards. And in this beautiful Christmas story, we're seeing God say, good news, your ideas about me were way off. Good news, your hope of being saved, even though you're really a hot mess, are really good. Good news, God loves you so much more than you ever imagined. Good news, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God has divinely intervened to save you. Will you let him? You know, somebody can be drowning in the middle of the ocean. Somebody can come and throw a life jacket out to them to save them, but you know, if you don't grab that thing, you're still gonna drown. An offer is only an offer, it has to be accepted. And that's the offer that God made 2,000 years ago, which by the way is still in effect today. He's offering to be your savior. He's offering to be your rescuer. But he must also be your Lord. It's a total package. And if he's not your Lord this morning, I encourage you, if you're a Christian, to make him your Lord. He's not just your God. He's the one in charge. Not just of a few things, of everything. Amen? And if you're here and Christ is not your Savior, not your Lord, before you leave these doors, you can be. It's not hard to become a Christian. It was hard for God to, to bring you salvation. But the gift is free. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you have done. We cannot imagine what glory you left to come and enter our world as, as humbly as you did. We don't understand it, but it reeks of love. It just reeks of love. A love we can't even begin to understand. And that not only did you do that for the masses, Lord, but you did it for me. You did it for every single person in this room. So, Lord Jesus, I pray this morning that those of us who are Christians here this morning would go out celebrating again that we had a Savior who was born to us and who came to rescue us. We thank you that you loved us enough to intervene. And Lord, if there's anybody here that does not yet know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that this morning they would. If you're here this morning and you would like to receive Christ as your Savior before you leave this morning, in just a moment I'm going to share a prayer out loud. It's not a magical prayer. There's no magical words. But if you would like to receive Christ as your Savior, you can simply repeat the words that I'm going to Pray out loud in your heart. God knows exactly what you're thinking. A 
prayer as simple as this. Dear Jesus, I have learned this morning that you're more than I thought you were. And I realize now I need you more than I thought I did. I want to be rescued. I want to be forgiven for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you took the punishment for my sins on the cross and endured the punishment I deserved so I wouldn't have to. And so this morning, I am receiving you and accepting you as my Savior. I invite you into my heart to change me from the inside out. Make me new. And from this day forward, you will be my Savior and my Lord. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God meant it. And a celebration just went off in heaven because somebody who was lost has been found. And Jesus' sacrifice has been used to save another soul. Lord God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for what it means. Thank you that it's not just a quaint little story, but that it's an epically life-changing, cataclysmic event. And thank you that it was, it was all about love. Thank you for loving us that much. And all God's people said, Merry Christmas.